Welcome. It's, uh, it's good to be here this afternoon. If you please take your seats. Uh, thanks to the Federalist Society for putting together this uh, panel. I'm uh, Tom Griffith of the DC Circuit and I'm grateful to be invited to, to moderate this panel. But more importantly, thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting uh, the dis distinguished members of our pan panel, about whom uh, I will say more shortly. Today's discussion about voter identification laws taps into an age-old concern. Are imposters voting, or voting twice, or thrice? We are all aware of what may be the oldest directive of the campaign manager to his charges. Vote early and often. In Cook County, of course, one adds, and vote the dead. But the concern with voter fraud is not of recent vintage. It has accompanied the exercise of the franchise since this powerful tool was first created, and it certainly predates the founding of the Republic. In his book, Deliver the Vote, a history of election fraud in the American political tradition, Tracy Campbell recounts that riots broke out in Philadelphia in 1742 over accusations that German immigrants were being brought in to pad vote totals. One of our distinguished panelists, John Fun, discusses a number of instances of voter fraud in his book, stealing elections. Um, in Crawford ver versus Marion County, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Indiana's voter ID law based on the history of voter fraud in the United States. But these issues are not only a matter of history. Many states have recently passed or have plans to pass stricter voter identification laws. Mississippi has just passed a new voter ID act and the Department of Justice is currently scrutinizing voter ID laws in Texas and South Carolina for preclearance under the Voting Rights Act. In assessing the merit of voter ID laws, we are really probing three separate but related spheres, policy, law, and technology. First, policy. Are the laws a good idea? Do they do more good than bad? The answer to that question, of course, rests on another more fundamental question. How many shenanigans will these laws prevent? How many votes are cast in an election by individuals who claim to be someone else? Once that's answered, we can then ask how many legitimate votes will voter ID laws prevent? In short, is this game worth the candle? Second, aside from these empirical questions, there are legal questions. At what point, if any, do laws addressing voter fraud become an illegal infringement on this most fundamental right of we the people? Is there a point at which voter ID laws become too heavy a burden on the voter to be legal? And third, have technological advancements that make possible early voting with the prospect of online line voting not far behind, have these advances overtaken the debate over old-fashioned in-person voter ID? In other words, is this already yesterday's fight. As for the format of today's discussion, each of our panelists will speak for eight minutes, then we'll allow them to respond to one another. Finally, we'll have time to take questions from the audience. First, allow me to briefly introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, first to my right, uh, John Fund. Uh, John is a former Wall Street Journal columnist and is currently a senior editor at the American Spectator and on book leave. He's authored a number of books, including the one I referred to before, Stealing Elections, How Vote, Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy, which he is uh, currently uh, revising. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Fun will be signing copies of his book in the uh, hallway afterwards. He's also a contributor to Fox News. Uh, professor Daniel Tajaki is the Jones Day Distinguished Professor in Law at Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University, whose area of expertise includes uh, among other things, voter ID laws and voting technology. Uh, Hans von Sp Spakovsky, sorry Hans, uh, is a senior legal fellow and the manager of the Civil Justice Reform uh, Initiative at the Heritage Foundation who writes and speaks frequently on voter ID laws. And finally, Professor Spencer Overton of uh, George Washington University. Uh, Professor Overton specializes in voting rights and campaign finance. Among many pieces, he has published an article on voter identification uh, recently in the Michigan Law Review. We'll, we'll hear from our panelists in that order. We'll start with Mr. Fun, John. Thank you. Almost everyone here remembers Florida 2000. 
For 47 days, the country was tied up in knots. The legitimacy of the election was called into question. Uh, many people still bear scars from that. There are many resentments. The election was too close for comfort. It was beyond the margin of victory. It was within the margin of litigation. I hope we never go back to such an experience again. And Florida was a perfect demonstration of what Walter Dean Burnham, America's most noted political scientist, said, that is the United States has the most sloppy election systems of any industrialized democracy. One of the themes of my book is, no, not everything is voter fraud that goes wrong in an election, but sometimes when rules are loosely written, even more loosely interpreted, when uh, there's too much play in the joints, uh, sometimes you can't tell where the incompetence ends and where the fraud begins. A perfect example is Washington State, the governor's race in 2004 that was decided after three recounts by 129 votes. King County, Seattle, discovered new ballots 17 times during that recount process. And even though a judge did not overturn the election, Judge John Bridges did find there were 1,401 illegal votes cast in that election more than 10 times the margin of victory between the two candidates. We have made a little bit of progress since Florida. In 2002, there was a bipartisan bill called the Help America Vote Act. Chris Dodd, the Democratic senator from Connecticut, who was the co-sponsor, said the goal of the bill was to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. That is my goal as well. It should be all of our goals. Unfortunately, HAVA has proved insufficient to the task. We have had other efforts. In 2005, the Bipartisan Commission on Federal Election Reform issued a report of 87 recommendations. Sadly, many of them have not been acted upon. One of those recommendations, and I know that Professor Overton was a distinguished member of that panel, and I also know that um, I was able to be a witness for that panel. Uh, all but three of the 21 commissioners in a bipartisan vote said that photo ID, voter ID, should be a part of election reform. President Carter, who himself had his first election to the state senate in Georgia, stolen from him through voter fraud that was later overturned by a court's ruling, said, in response to critics of the photo ID law, he called it, quote, a move forward to getting more people to vote. It would not restrict people from voting. It will be uniformly applied throughout the country, and it will be non-discriminatory. That, again, should be our goal. And Andrew Young, who was Mr. Carter's UN ambassador, has also said that getting photo ID into the hands of people who may not have one is a worthy goal. You cannot be part of the mainstream of American economic life if you don't have a photo ID. You can't cash a check. You can't travel in many places. You can't check into a hotel. You can't rent a video. You can't enter a federal building. Getting photo ID into people's hands if they don't have one is a positive good. And then in 2006, we have the Supreme Court decision authored by John Paul Stevens, which said, quote, flagrant examples of voter fraud have been documented throughout this nation's history by respected historians and journalists, and examples have surfaced in recent years. They, demonst they demonstrate that not only is the risk of voter fraud real, but that it could affect the outcome of a close election. We are often told by some people that voter fraud is either non-existent or completely irrelevant or insignificant. Well, ask the residents of Minnesota that question. We now know the significance of the Senate race in Minnesota in 2008. Al Franken defeated Norm Coleman by 312 votes. After six months of litigation, uh, Senator Franken was seated, and the Democrats won a critical 60th vote, which was able to shut off filibusters. It proved crucial in the passage of Obamacare in December of that year in the United States Senate. Uh, it can easily be said that Obamacare would be substantially different if Senator Franken had not been seated in that race. We now know an awful lot more about that Minnesota race than we did then. There were 312 votes between the two candidates. Did you know that there were 144 people convicted so far of voting illegally with intent and knowledge. Convicted. Here's the list. There are over 200 more in the pipeline. Now, admittedly, even though this is a felony, the penalties have not been severe, 
I think this should tell us that in a close election with such profound national significance, voter fraud, and this was voter fraud, can make a difference. I could go into other examples. The clerk of Troy, New York has recently pled guilty and been forced to resign. Uh, voter fraud in public housing projects. The supervisor of elections in Madison County just this month was arrested along with eight other people in a voter fraud scandal. And it goes on and on. The second thing we often hear is that attempts to combat voter fraud, especially ID laws, have discriminatory intent and that may be even on purpose. Look, there are a lot of problems with the arguments and debates about this. On the one hand, a state that only passes a photo ID law and nothing else to clean up elections, nothing to do with absentee ballot fraud, which is the tool of choice by most fraudsters, or same-day registration issues, or other issues, or does nothing to expand access to the ballot and enable people to get IDs, that is clearly an incomplete choice and a panacea at best. But it is also true that a lot of statistics that are being hurled around, such as that 25% of African Americans lack photo ID, do not have any basis in substance or in credibility, and they should just go by the by. Sadly, the bipartisan efforts on this issue, which were exemplified by the 2005 Commission, have gone by the boards lately. This has become an intensely partisan fight on both sides. Bill Clinton, who um, said in July that basically I have never seen an effort to curb, the ballot, to curb access to the ballot since the days of Jim Crow and the other Jim Crow, since the days of the poll tax and the other Jim Crow burdens on voting, the determined effort to live at the franchise that we see today. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee, has also compared the search for photo ID laws to Jim Crow. This is unfortunate because just a few days after Mr. Clinton and Debbie Wasserman Schultz spoke, the state of Rhode Island passed a photo ID law not the most comprehensive in the country, but a photo ID law nonetheless. It was pushed by House Speaker Gordon Fox, who is the first African-American speaker of that body. It is pushed, pushed by Harold Metz, the only African-American senator in Rhode Island, and pushed by Senator Juan Picardo, the first Latino elected to a Rhode Island Senate seat. In all of these cases, they said, the, re the request for photo ID and the ensuing legislation came from constituents in their districts who had been the victims of voter fraud or who felt that fraud was endemic or a serious threat to the credibility of the elections. Congressman Arthur Davis, who was the man who seconded Barack Obama's nomination for president in 2008, recently wrote an op-ed on voter ID laws in which he said, when I was a congressman, I took the path of least resistance Without any evidence to back it up, I lapsed into the rhetoric of various partisans and activists who contend that requiring photo ID to vote is a suppression tactic. The truth is the most aggressive contemporary voter suppression in the African American community, at least in Alabama, is the wholesale manufacture of ballots at the polls and absentee in parts of the black belt. And in conclusion, he said, I was disappointed to see Bill Clinton, a very good president of my party and an even greater ex-president, compare voter ID to Jim Crow. It is chilling to see the intimidation tactics brought to bear on African-American Democratic legislators in Rhode Island who had the nerve to support a voter ID law in that very liberal state. In short, we have two civil rights to protect. The civil right to access to the vote. We fought a long civil rights struggle to get rid of the poll tax and other impediments to voting. We need to preserve and extend those gains. We also have another civil right, the right not to have anyone's vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, is voting twice, is an illegal alien, is a felon who's ineligible to vote, or falls into any number of other categories. We can preserve both civil rights, and we can, as Senator Dodd said, make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. Let's pursue both goals. Thank you. Well, I very much uh, 
appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've spoken at a number of Federal Society events in my career, many at my law school and, in, uh, and of our Columbus chapter. This is the first opportunity I've had to attend your national convention. Um, and uh, while I expect that my perspective on this issue will be quite different from many of yours, um, I am uh, very appreciative of and admiring of this organization's commitment to robust debate on important issues like this one. Um, it's my experience that we generally learn a lot more talking to those with whom we disagree with than those with whom we agree, um, rather than just sort of the constant echo chambers that we often find ourselves in these days in our very polarized atmosphere. Um, so for all these reasons, I'm happy to be here. Um, my focus in my remarks is going to be on voter fraud and its exaggeration. Professor Overton will then be talking more about the impact of voter ID laws. I'll have a bit to say about that but not much. Um, I'm reminded as I was listening to John's remarks and as I was reading the second edition of his book on the plane out here this morning of something that my namesake Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Now I'm not accusing John or Hans, who I've debated before, of deliberate distortion of the facts, but I think that in their zeal to make a strong argument for measures that would make it more difficult to vote and have one's vote counted, um, they've made a number of errors, omissions, and half recorded truths. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about a few of these today and uh, also um, provide an overview of what I think uh, the problems in our election system really are. Now, let me start with one point on which um, John and I are in agreement. I suspect most of us are in agreement. There are a lot of problems still with our election system. I think that HAVA has made things better um, but I think that our elections are still not run to the standards that they ought to be, um, that there is considerable incompetence out there, and frankly, our elections are not funded at the level that they ought to be. I think the partisanship of election administration in this country is a disgrace. Other democracies do much better than we do. Um, that said, the evidence of widespread voter fraud uh, is simply not there. I don't claim that there's none, but I do assert that it is greatly exaggerated. And in, in making this point, I'm going to focus, first of all, on some of the exaggerations and errors in John's book, um, which hopefully he can correct for the third edition. Um, so let me start with the one that is probably the least important, but to me the most amusing. Um, he quotes Daniel Okapi, a law professor at Ohio State University, and because I have no colleague by that name, I can only assume that he's referring to me. Ironically, John quotes me in a section that's talking about the sloppiness of our election administration system. Uh, but in fact, sloppiness about the facts is a hallmark of this book. Uh, and if it were only a comparison to, or a mistaking me for a four-legged zebra-like creature, I could overlook it. But in fact, uh, the errors are, and misstatements or exaggerations are more significant. Let me give just three examples. Um, John, in the first edition of his book, on page one, asserted that eight of the 19 9-11 hijackers were 
able to register. Later, when he appeared on Lou Dobbs' show and Glenn Beck's show, he actually said that eight of the 19 were registered. I didn't find that allegation repeated in the second edition. And in fact, as Professor Overton and Professor Minaiti of Barnard have found, that claim is not substantiated by the facts. Nevertheless, it gets repeated over and over. And this is what often happens with allegations of voter fraud. They take on a life of their own, even when they're investigated and found not to have been substantiated. Unfortunately, the impression often sticks. Another example, now this one is true as far as it goes, but incomplete. He discusses the Dornan Sanchez race from 1996, saying there were 4,023 illegal votes possibly cast. He doesn't emphasize the possibly, but uh, I would. In fact, if you actually look at what happened, this was exhaustively investigated, not only by the Republican Congress, but by the district attorney's office, by the California Secretary of State. The DA conducted some 300 interviews, reviewed 33,000 documents, raided the office of an immigrants' rights group that was helping voters register. Turns out there were some voters who registered before they were awarded citizenship. At the time, or before they had been sworn in, I should say, as citizens. Um, it is true that some voters were sent a letter which said, congratulations, your application for citizenship has been approved. And before they were actually sworn in, some of them registered. It is not, however, true that there were a significant number of people who fraudulently voted. At any rate, that was never proven. Third example. Milwaukee 2004, something to which John devotes an entire chapter in his book. He relies extensively on a police department report. Now, part of, this, part of what's in this chapter, chapter 9 of his book, I agree with. Uh, there was a lot of incompetence in the way Milwaukee's 2004 election was run. The election authority there has since been replaced by a new staff, which includes someone from law enforcement. Um, Hanlon's razor most definitely applies to Milwaukee 2004. Never attribute to malice that which can be explained by incompetence. Um, well, was there fraud? Well, it turns out there were a lot of data entry errors and some of the people who were alleged to have illegally voted. In fact, there was a data entry error having to do, for example, with their address, which made it appear as though they were registered at a non-existent address. In the end, what was actually proven? Seven people were found to have voted illegally, all of them because they were ineligible felons. Another three unknowingly voted illegally because they were felons. Uh, this is not a problem that voter identification laws will fix. And stepping back for a second, I know my time has expired, so I'm just going to go for another few seconds on this. It's important for us to distinguish not only incompetence from fraud, but also different kinds of election-related fraud. There's insider fraud, like ballot stuffing. That won't be solved by voter ID. There's registration fraud, like some members of ACORN were shown to have done. That won't be solved by voter ID. And then there's voter fraud. Only one sub-subcategory of voter fraud will actually be addressed by voter ID and not the most important subcategory, which is people voting through absentee ballots. If you think of it logically, if you wanted to cheat, you'd be crazy to do it by actually going to the polls pretending to be someone you're not, the only problem that voter ID will fix. Most of the fraud we have, and it's not widespread, but it does sometimes happen, is with absentee ballots. So, Think very carefully before you recommend voter ID as a solution for what I would admit are the many problems with our election system. Thank you. Gosh, so much to say and only eight minutes to do it in. Uh, Spencer, I'm glad you made it. We were afraid you were going to be late. We heard you'd missed your first train. I hope, I hope it wasn't because they were asking you for a photo ID when you got on the train. Um, <laughs> 
Look, one of the key, we're, we're coming into an election 2012. Uh, one of the key principles in any fair uh, election is ensuring that the person who votes a ballot is actually the person uh, voting the ballot. The fairest way to do that is to, one, require people who are registering to vote to show and prove that they are United States citizens, and second, that they authenticate their identity at the polls with a photo ID. Uh, when Lincoln Chafee, who's not exactly a conservative, independent governor of Rhode Island, signed uh, their new photo ID law, which was sponsored by Democratic state legislators, he said, quote, requiring ID at the polling place is a reasonable request to ensure the accuracy and integrity of our elections. Now, the opponents of this will tell you two things. One, there's just no voter fraud that this is needed for. And two, uh, this will suppress the vote of uh, individual voters, particularly minorities uh, and Democrats. Uh, both of those arguments are completely untrue. There have been numerous academic studies done. Uh, there was a great one by the University of Delaware, University of Nebraska, looked at uh, turnout across the country, all 50 states, compared states with uh, voter ID requirements and those that didn't. They found that there was no depression in the turnout uh, of voters by this across all racial socioeconomic lines. And in fact, in the conclusion of their report, they said, quote, concerns about voter ID laws affecting turnout are much ado about nothing. Okay, the Heritage Foundation, where I worked, did a similar study, found exactly the same thing. Voter fraud exists. There are plenty of examples of it. I've written uh, several case studies for the Heritage Foundation about this. And I can tell you that the opponents, you know, mostly liberals, were, uh, were greatly astonished when the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Indiana's photo ID law, not in a 5-4 decision, but in a 6-3 decision written by one of the most liberal justices of the court, Justice Stevens. And why did that happen? Well, the argument that there really is no such thing as voter fraud uh, didn't really go with a uh, justice who uh, grew up in his professional career in the city of Chicago. <laughs> All right, now, the Democratic African-American senator in Rhode Island, Harold Metz, who uh, John mentioned, and who sponsored the Rhode Island law said, quote, very few adults lack one of the forms of ID that will be accepted, and the rare person who does can get a free voter ID card. And every state that's passed one of these has provided a free voter ID card to those who don't have them. Now, again, opponents will say, well, you know, there's just hardly any impersonation fraud in the country. Well, as Senator Metz said in his great letter that he posted last week in a local paper called the, and I'm not kidding, the Wound Socket Patch, he pointed out the old system was not set up to readily weed out fraud, but that his own state representative and her daughter had had their votes stolen. Okay, well, the Seventh Circuit said the same thing over Indiana's case. They said, you know, how are you going to catch this uh, if you don't have the tool of voter ID to catch it? Now, the other problem with this whole argument is that it will stop other things like false voter registrations. You know, it's hard to vote in the name of John Smith if you're not John Smith, unless you have a photo ID in the name of John Smith. It also will stop, in some cases, not all, double voting by people who are registered in more than one state. And there's a great example of this, very embarrassing for the League of Women Voters. They filed an amicus brief in the, Indi in the Supreme Court over Indiana's photo ID law. And to illustrate just how terrible this Indiana law was, uh, they named this elderly Indiana voter who just had a terrible time when she showed up to vote. So a local Indiana paper went and interviewed her. They wanted to find out why did she have a problem. Well, the reason she had a problem was because when she showed up at the poll, she pulled out a Florida driver's license. And not only did she have a Florida driver's license, she was registered to vote in Florida. They had a second home down there. She had switched her driver's license, she'd gotten registered to vote, and in fact, she had applied for a homestead exemption on her Florida property, which for those of you who are property lawyers, you know that means you're claiming residence in the state. Now, I'm not saying she intended to vote twice, but she could have easily if Indiana didn't have a photo ID law and that stopped her from doing it. Now, the other thing it will stop is voting by illegal aliens. And I can tell you that's been going on, unfortunately, for a long time. I wrote a case study about a voter fraud prosecution in 1982 in Chicago. It was the largest voter fraud prosecution ever conducted by the U.S. Justice Department. 
They uh, prosecuted dozens of aliens for registering and voting in that election, and the estimate of the U.S. attorney at the time was that there were 80,000 aliens registered in the, uh, Chicago. And for those of you who want to say, well, that's ancient history, I'll tell you that just two months ago in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I happen to be vice chairman of the electoral board, we turned over the names of more than 100 registered voters, some of whom have voted in prior elections, to the attorney general's office because we've gotten information that uh, they are not United States citizens. Oh, and by the way, uh, Dan, I'd be happy to give you all a copy of an order that I have from a federal immigration court in Florida about a uh, Cuban woman who came to the United States in April 2004, promptly got registered and voted in the November election. Um, the number of voters in Georgia and Indiana who went to the polls in the 2008 election after the photo ID laws went into effect went up dramatically. Now, it's, it's true, you know, we had a dramatic increase in turnout uh, all over the country in the 2008 election. But the increase in turnout in those states was even bigger than in states without photo ID. The number of African Americans voting in Georgia climbed from 25% to 30% from the 04 to the 08 election. Democratic turnout went up 6.1 percentage points in Georgia. That was the fifth highest in the country. And the overall turnout in the state of Georgia, after the photo ID law went into effect, was 6.7 percent, the second highest of any state in the United States. The Georgia photo ID law was upheld in state court. It was upheld in federal court. And it's true that, you know, initially the federal judge, basically, who had been forum shopped, by the plaintiffs in that case, he was most, considered the most liberal judge in the state, you know, he initially issued a temporary injunction. Why? Because in order to get a free ID, you had to sign an affidavit saying that you were an indigent voter. Well, Georgia promptly amended that, said you can get a free photo ID. Two years later, he threw out the case, and he particularly noted that the plaintiffs had claimed there were hundreds of thousands of Georgians, particularly African Americans, who did not have photo ID, would not be able to vote, and they had failed to, the plaintiffs failed to produce a single witness who they could show would not be able to vote, including the plaintiff, NAACP, who couldn't come up with a single one of its members who would have a problem voting. Same thing happened in the Indiana case. In fact, the language in that case is great. The federal judge said that despite apocalyptic claims, again, they couldn't come up with any identifiable registered voter who would have a problem voting. Again, in Indiana, Democratic turnout in the 08 election went up by eight percentage points, um, over eight percentage points, the largest increase uh, of any, any uh, uh, Democratic turnout in the country. Black turnout was even higher in the 2010 election when Barack Obama was not on the ballot. Um, my, my, time is out, uh, my time is out, but I, I'll end with this. Uh, the claims that this is Jim Crow are historically preposterous. Okay, Jim Crow not only kept people from voting, it kept, kept people out of public accommodations. It limited their ability to travel in public transportation. Um, Every time I get an, on an airplane, I have to show photo ID. I have to show one to get on Amtrak. I haven't heard anybody say that that's uh, Jim Crow. You know, to check into a hotel, I have never not been asked for a photo ID. I haven't heard anybody say that that's Jim Crow. And I'll tell you, the constituents of the organizations that are against this, like the NAACP, they don't agree with their leadership because the polling shows overwhelmingly people believe in this, they support it across all racial lines, and if you want to get further evidence of this, I'll tell you, look at what happened Tuesday in the state of Mississippi when a referendum was voted on to amend the Constitution to, to impose photo ID. It was overwhelmingly approved by Mississippi voters, and I just checked the numbers. Uh, there are 25 counties in the state with a majority black population, and a majority of those counties voted in favor of photo ID. Thanks.
So thank you all for, uh, for having me here. Um, and Judge Griffith talked about an age-old concern. He started off talking about an age-old concern. I, I thought he was going to talk about an, an age-old concern in terms of government regulation and restrictions on individual liberties. I, th I thought that might be a concern. Uh, the kind of uh, thing that happened, uh, you know, decades, centuries ago when Eastern Europeans were kept off of voting rolls, they were asked to re-register every election cycle. The, the objective here was to prevent uh, Eastern Europeans who were, who were new immigrants to the United States from voting. Uh, the, the kind of thing that I think Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas talk about when they talk about campaign finance regulation and they, they talk about it as an attempt to restrict and restrain uh, certain voices uh, uh, here. So uh, that, that's the, uh, an, an age-old concern that, that I know that at least some, some people uh, in this room, I, I think, are concerned about. Uh, now, in terms of this ID question, the, 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 we have voter ID laws across the country. We've had them for, for years. The question isn't voter ID or no voter ID. That's not the question. Most states have voter ID laws. They have ID laws like, uh, hey, if you don't have a photo ID, you sign an affidavit, or maybe you can use a utility bill to show, to prove your identity, or we'll do a signature match to uh, uh, establish your identity. So the question isn't, should we have absolutely no uh, tool to deal with fraud or a strict photo ID requirement, right? Uh, the question is, should we use what has been used in the past uh, by many states across the country for our history up until 2006? We didn't have photo ID requirement in any state. And right now, most states uh, don't have a photo ID requirement. So I think, I think that's the real question here. Um, now, just to kind of respond to a couple of Hans's points, and I know we'll get into some, some back and forth here. Um, Hans talked about Georgia in 2008, uh, Obama uh, in 2010, an African-American candidate, Mike Thurman, ran for U.S. Senate in Georgia. And, and that really goes to the fact that the studies are not conclusive on this impact. There are other variables that determine turnout. And because we've only had photo ID in the United States, a strict photo ID law uh, in particular states since 2006, we don't really have good data, real good studies in terms of the impact of, of this. Hans also talked about Rhode Island and a, a bipartisan uh, group of, of people who put forward an ID. That wasn't a strict ID law. Basically, you could sign an affidavit, say who you are, cast a provisional ballot, and the assumption was, unless it was proven by the state that you're a fraudulent voter, that your ballot would be counted. So the presumption was that you're a legitimate voter in that situation. So I, I don't know that that's the best example. Uh, we, we heard from about Artur Davis, and you know I respect Artur, went to law school with him, I've known him a long time, and if you look at his concerns, he's talked a lot about absentee ballots, and as Dan talked, mentioned, uh, absentees are uh, different than voting at the polls. Certainly, I commend Hans has talked about some measures that we should adopt uh, for absentees to prevent fraud, uh, and I commend him for being consistent in terms of both absentee and at the polling place. Uh, but it, it is uh, different. It's a different context than in person. Uh, now, I was asked to, t I'm, I'm sorry, one, one other thing, there's just so, so many things and I know we'll have some time to talk, talk about it. Uh, we, we heard about the plane, you need an ID to get on, on the plane. Uh, I need an ID to, to maybe get on this train uh, here that, that uh, I, I was, was laying on. Uh, in reality, you don't. In reality, you go to the airport without an ID and there is a bypass procedure, just as there is in many states. 
across the country in terms of bypass if you don't have a photo ID. There's a bypass procedure at the airport. Now, it may involve a cavity search uh, here, you know, in terms of, of uh, maybe a little more extensive, right? But, <laughs> but the point is, you can get on the plane without an ID, right? And, and that's not the case in terms of these couple of states that have adopted this strict ID law. Another point with that is it's a different context. I mean, just let's just say that an ID would prevent terrorists from blowing up a plane. It certainly makes sense to keep one terrorist off the plane in order to prevent 10,000 people from, from uh, dying, right? That, that makes sense. But does it make sense to stop one illegitimate voter from casting a ballot if we have numbers that suggest that 10,000 legitimate voters uh, could be excluded. And I want to get into the numbers right now in terms of this empirical piece. 11 to 20 million Americans don't have ID. Um, 3 million Americans with disabilities. There are new laws in South Carolina, Texas, and Tennessee that don't permit the use of student ID to cast a ballot. In Wisconsin, only 3% of students studying in a dorm had an ID with their current address uh, on it. Now, that's not the full question. The question is to what extent does this impact turnout? Just as John may say, 4,100 people uh, cast you know, fraudulent votes in, in Washington, and that's certainly something I'd want to look into. I, I don't know that it's been shown that all 4,100 votes would have been uh, fraudulent votes would have been prevented with a photo ID. Similarly, we don't know that all 20 million people would vote, right? So I don't know that it's fair on the face of it to say, hey, we're excluding 20 million uh, Americans. So we look at the academic studies, and the studies do show that there is uh, an impact on turnout. It's not huge, and, and these, again, these, these studies aren't determinative. Uh, the Pitt study, for example, showed that out of 2.8 million ballots cast, about 1,000 were cast provisionally in Indiana, and only 137 of those were counted. In other words, people went back with a photo ID. Now, maybe some of the 1,000 were illegitimate. Some of them maybe were legitimate and people didn't go back. But that's, that's what we're, we're talking about there. And maybe also there are some people who didn't go to vote in the first place because they didn't have an ID. But, but, but very honestly, we're, we're not talking about, let's say, 10% or, or huge. I'm, I'm not trying to, I think we should focus on uh, real facts and empirical data. If we look at, thank you, uh, Alvarez in that study, Alvarez showed that there weren't racial differences that he saw that were just focused on race, but he did see that ID depressed turnout, photo ID depressed turnout for less educated and, and lower income uh, individuals here. So really what we're talking about is how do we look at this relative to the amount of fraud that's out there? So for example, if there are 1,000 out of 2 million uh, impro uh, legitimate votes that aren't cast in Indiana. Uh, yeah, if we've got 10,000 fraudulent votes being cast, yeah, we, we, we definitely need, need an ID. But if we've only got one or 10 fraudulent votes that are cast out of that 2 million, which is consistent with the study of Ohio voters, right, then the analysis needs to be a bit different. Um, I, get, I need to wrap up, it's my time here, and, and the basic point I want to make is the biggest threat to democracy is not average Americans who go to vote. The, the biggest threat is incumbent politicians here. The purpose of government voting here is government of, by, and for the people, and we don't want to uh, introduce tools that are not going to really prevent fraud, but uh, actually discourage uh, people from casting a ballot and voting. And so I look forward to our, our back and forth. Thank you. I want to thank uh, each member of the panel for their presentation. And, and now we'll turn to a uh, chance for panel members to 
speak to one another and to respond to points you made. John, would you like to start first? And uh, Well, there are court records here regarding Indiana and Georgia, which are the strict photo ID laws. And by the way, there are ways to vote in those states without, um, I think, an undue burden if you come without a photo ID. Um, and in fact, uh, I think in the last mayor's race in Indianapolis, uh, I think a grand total of 19 people were turned away and several of them were able to later go on and in the next few days prove that they could vote and they did vote. The rest did not bother and we have to leave it to uh, future research to find out whether or not those ballots were cast by valid voters or invalid voters. But we have a court record in Indiana because the plaintiffs challenging the photo ID law said that up to 989,000 registered voters did not possess acceptable photo identification. Judge Barker, who was the trial judge, said only about 43,000 Indiana residents lacked a state-issued driver's license or identification card. She said that plaintiffs had not produced any evidence that real people would have their right to vote unduly burdened by the photo ID law. She then continued that the argument that almost one million registered voters didn't possess a driver's license or other acceptable photo identification was, quote, utterly incredible and unreliable. 43,000, by the way, goes into 989,000 approximately 25 times. That's interesting new math, but not good enough for the court whenever they actually look at this issue. The percentage of people who lack acceptable photo identification is far lower than the estimates that you have heard. And every empirical study has shown that consistently over and over again. And again, echoing Andrew Young, who was in the civil rights struggle, if there are people out there without a photo ID, let's get them one. Let's get them a free one so they can participate in the mainstream of economic life. As he said, we are doing them a favor by getting them an ID. That should be one of our priorities. And again, our goal is to make it easy to vote, hard to cheat. Thank you. With that, I'll just let, I'll get out of the way and let the panel go ahead, speak go to ahead. one another. Yeah, let me briefly respond. And I want to get back to a point that Spencer made and that he had made several years ago in his excellent article on voter identification. What we ought to be looking here, and there may be actually consensus on the panel on this narrow point, is what we ought to be looking here is a cost-benefit analysis to the extent we can. And granted, you know, there's a lot we know, a lot we don't know. So what are the costs of voter ID? Well, the cost of voter ID is that it may prevent or impede eligible people from voting. Uh, it's simply not true that all the studies show is as John just said, that the, yes, that the number of people who lack ID is very low. Uh, it is true there is some variation from a low of 1%, but that was just looking at registered voters, and there were a lot of people in that survey they weren't able to reach to a high of over 20% from a study in Wisconsin. I think the best estimate of the percentage of people who lack ID is around 11%. Now, what's very clear is that, and, and this, on this point the studies are uniformly in agreement, is that there are disparities in terms of who lacks ID as one would expect. Um, race is an, an independent determinant. Income, socioeconomic attainment levels certainly are, and people, people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, according to all the studies, even the ones that find very low levels, are much less likely to have government issued photo ID. And we should bear in mind that they may not have the money, at least easily disposable money, to get the documents that they need, like a birth certificate, to get photo ID, even if it's provided free of charge. A 2008 survey found that uh, two million people in the country said that they didn't vote because they lacked acceptable ID. And this is even without a government-issued photo ID requirement in most of the states. Now that may be, that probably is on the high end because some people may be less than honest with the survey taker or themselves. I, I, I'm a, I'll concede that point. But look at the evidence on the other side. How much voter impersonation fraud is out there? And, and by the way, it's not going to prevent felons from voting to have a voter ID requirement. It's not going to prevent double voting. It, uh, it's, it's not going to prevent most of the illegal voting that's out there. What it will prevent is people going to the polls, 
pretending to be someone they are not. How common is that? Extremely uncommon. Professor Justin Levitt of Loyola found since, uh, since 2000 of the approximately 400 million people who voted, nine documented instances. This is less than one in a million. It's more along the lines of one in a hundred million. Uh, I, my next? Okay. Um, I wanted to correct something that uh, Dan, with all due respect, said earlier. He talked about, remember the Doran Sanchez race, right? 1996, California. Incumbent Bob Dornan was beaten by Loretta Sanchez by almost a thousand votes. And I think Dan said, well, there was almost no evidence of people who were not U.S. citizens voting. Well, it just so happens that uh, the House Administration Counsel who helped investigate that case, Roman Bueller, is in the room. I've read the report. Roman can confirm that what I'm saying is correct. In fact, that report concluded that there was uh, evidence, uh, a preponderance of evidence, that between 600 and 700 individuals who were not U.S. citizens had voted in that election. They didn't overturn the election because there was still a 200 vote margin. But remember this, they were comparing the voter registration rolls against INS records. And the INS records only have two kinds of aliens in their files. People who are here legally and have applied for U.S. citizenship and illegal aliens who've actually been arrested and put into the system. So we almost had the election overturned by more votes than decided the presidential election in 2000 in Florida, and it wasn't even catching illegal aliens who were voting. Now, people on the other side of this will say, well, you know, the penalties are such, they're, they're not gonna, illegal aliens are not gonna try to get voter registration cards. Sorry, that's wrong. There was testimony, again, the 1980s, uh, after the 82 uh, voter fraud case I talked about, by an INS director in Illinois who said, in fact, uh, illegal aliens liked getting voter registration cards because they were so easy to get without having to show any ID, and it's a gateway card for getting other ID. In fact, in a very weird turn of fate, to, uh, if you all look at the I-9 form, now remember, what does the U.S. government require all of you to do if you want to get a job, pretty basic, right, in the United States? You have to prove to your employer that your identity and your citizenship or work permit the right to vote, right? Well, one is, what is one of the cards you can use to prove your identity for the I-9 form? A voter registration card, which is extremely easy to get. Um, just one or two other points. I keep hearing that, well, voter ID isn't going to stop these other kinds of fraud, you know, felons voting, uh, absentee ballot fraud. Well, of course not. But we're not saying that that's the only kind of security you should have in an election. You need security in an election from the time you register to vote, the time you vote, to the time the votes are being counted. And there are a whole series of security steps you take to do that. One of the best ways you can combine voter ID with another measure to prevent absentee ballot fraud is, quite frankly, what Chris Kobach, who I think is a member of the Federalist Society, he's, he's been here, new Secretary of State of Kansas. And what did they pass in their photo ID law? They also passed a provision saying that from now on, when you order an absentee ballot in Kansas, you have to include either your driver's license number on the form or a photocopy of your photo ID. That makes it much more difficult to, on a mass basis, um, order fraudulent absentee ballots, which unfortunately happens too often. That's a way of using photo ID and using a new requirement of absentee ballot to, to prevent that kind of thing. Um, thank you. So I agree with Hans that absentee fraud is different than voting uh, at the polls, uh, fraud at the polls. I, but I would also say that we shouldn't use claims of absentee ballot fraud to justify uh, a photo ID at the polls, that it's apples and oranges. Again, we want to tailor the law to deal with the problem. Um, I look at my photo ID and it doesn't have my citizenship on it. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a felon, uh, but if I were, I don't think it would have my felon status on it. And so I, I don't know that the ID deals with a number of these things that have been acknowledged uh, and, and pointed out. F finally, I would say that the MOVE Act, 
was a very important piece of legislation. This is a legislation that uh, re revamped UOCAVA and helped with military and overseas voting. And, and one of the provisions of the MOVE Act basically said that states shouldn't require notaries for absentees for folks who are, who are overseas. Now, now, in the military, as I understand it, many units have a legal officer, and that legal officer is a notary, right? But, you know, requiring that all these military absentee ballots be notarized in particular states, you know, it is a problem. Yeah, maybe it prevents some fraud, but it really hampers access as well. We've got to do this cost-benefit analysis, and I think that we need to do a similar analysis with regard to photo ID. Professor Overden, I will give you a trade. I'll scrap every absentee law in this country that requires a notary if we can get a provision like Kansas where you have to list the last few digits of either your driver's license or your social security number, which everyone has, and uh, or include a photocopy of a photo ID, which the readily available nature of which would help curb fraud not only at the polls but absentee ballots. I think that's a fair swap and would be good for all concerned. Uh, you, you know, I, I'll tell you, uh, John, I need to really look at the data on absentees. I, I think absentee, it, it's more problematic in terms of fraud. So I can't say, I can't determine what kind of swap that is without looking at the data, but I would suspect that that's a better swap than saying, hey, let's have photo ID at the polls. Again, I think it's apples and oranges. It's a different universe. Came close to consensus. I tried. <laughs> uh, I, and I, I want to make two more points, if I may. Um, it was said that, well, you know, it's a problem in some states that they don't allow a student ID to be uh, the, the card you could use to vote. Well, let me point out that there are some states, like Georgia, where if you have a student ID issued by the state university system, in fact, you can use that to vote. Much has been made of the fact that a couple months ago when Texas passed its law, they don't allow a student ID, uh, but they do allow a, uh, oh, was it a hunting, a hunting license, I think? Yeah, right. or, yeah. <laughs> well, now, now, but this is, this is how things get twisted in the media. And otherwise, this was seen as evidence uh, that they're trying to prevent students from voting. Well, no, what, what's the difference between the two states? Well, there's a big difference. In Georgia, they don't provide in-state tuition to illegal aliens or let them go to college. So if you have a student ID, it's pretty clear that you are a U.S. citizen. That's not the case in Texas, as we've all found out recently, which is why <laughs> the student ID doesn't work. And uh, look, uh, so, Spencer so is, is perfectly correct that a driver's license won't prevent uh, someone who is in the United States legally but is not a citizen from voting using it. It will prevent illegal aliens from doing it except for the two states that do that. But in fact, that's easily fixed. If you're in Utah, you're not going to be able to vote using a Utah driver's license if you're in the United States legally but not a citizen. Why? Well, because a couple of years ago they discovered all these people who weren't citizens getting driver's licenses and so now uh, they have a special notation on the face of the driver's license that says whether or not you, uh, you're a U.S. citizen or not. In fact, that's something that every state in the, in the union should do. John, you know, we were talking about trades. Uh, I'd like to make a, a proposal to you in terms of a horse trade, okay? And, and my, my horse trade would be um, photo ID at the polls for in exchange for election day registration. So we, we have <laughs> So hold, hold on now. Now photo ID the the purpose of election day the purpose order, of a order. 30 day registration period is presumably to prevent fraud here. But if we've got a photo ID that uh, for for some would say is is fail proof in terms of preventing fraud, why do we need a registration period? Why do we need a 30-day registration period? Well, Hans has something to say on this as well. Same-day registration can work fairly well, and as Maine just proved with their voting on the issue. Uh, North Dakota, for example, has no registration of any kind. Uh, 
But when you get to complex, diverse, big states, the electorate is very leery of same-day registration. Colorado voted for Barack Obama. California has voted Democratic uh, in every election since 1988. Both states very a few years ago had same-day registration ballot initiatives. They outspent opponents 20 to 1. Uh, they had all of the newspaper endorsements and both went down to crashing defeats in those two liberal states or two at least liberal to moderate states by 60 to 40. So the popular belief is same-day registration has some problems with it and we'd have to calibrate that very carefully. I'm not saying we can't do that. I'm not saying the trade that Professor Overton suggests can't be made, but clearly, even in places like Colorado and California, they recoil from it. Yeah, and one uh, of the, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you don't, yeah. um, so on election day registration, um, if you actually look at the evidence in terms of election changes, what affects turnout in a positive way? The one change in election administration that has consistently be, been shown to increase participation, which is what we all want, or at least say we want, is same-day registration, roughly 5%, and it is very popular, as the main vote just demonstrated. People in fairly good-sized states, like Wisconsin and Minnesota, they've had election day registration for quite a while and are happy with it. Now, I do agree that if you're going to have election day registration, yes, you yes. do have to have some sort of heightened identification requirement to make sure that those who are appearing to vote on election day are in, <coughs> in fact eligible. Let me make up a response to that, and then I suggest that we start asking, uh, taking questions. Uh, the problem with same day registration is that it gives election officials no opportunity to verify the accuracy of the information they're getting. Now, some will say, well, if they have a photo ID, they don't need to do that. But that's, in fact, not true. One of the things that the Help America Vote Act was passed, passed, passed in 2002 did is it said that when states set up computerized statewide voter registration lists, they are supposed to do data comparisons with other state records like DMV and also, very importantly, State Department of Correction records. In other words, if you want to prevent the kind of problem that John was talking about, where we had hundreds of felons illegally voting in Minnesota, uh, you're not going to be able to do that if you have same-day registration because election officials won't have the chance to check that person's name against the state correction records and make sure they're actually eligible uh, uh, to vote. And on same-day registration, there was a great study put out a couple of weeks ago by the Maine Heritage Foundation, not related to Heritage where I work, in which they took a look at turnout in Maine right. since they put in same-day registration. And in fact, they found that it had not had any effect on registration. And there were three elections where they had some of the worst turnout, and it was after they put that requirement into place. Okay. With that, with that let's uh, turn it over to the audience. We have a microphone in the back. If you'll step up to the microphone, state your name, and uh, direct your question to a member of the panel, and let's please remember to make them questions. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. I, my name is Roman Bueller. I am the uh, counsel that Hans referred to who supervised the investigation uh, on election fraud in the Dornan Sanchez race. And I have two questions. Um, the first is uh, uh, for Dan. Uh, we heard sworn testimony, and I'm sure you're aware of all this because you've studied the case. We heard sworn testimony uh, that individuals went door to door and said, you don't have to be a registered, you don't have to be a citizen to register to vote. Um, we tried to get records from the INS. We were fought tooth and nail uh, by the uh, Clinton administration. We were attacked relentlessly by the Democratic leadership in Congress for being racist for conducting this investigation. My question to you is, we found evidence, strong evidence, persuasive evidence of 650 illegal votes. You mentioned that there were no significant number of illegal votes found. And I wonder, my question is, do you think 650 votes is a significant number? And Spencer, my question to you is, you sounded like you were praising the Rhode Island uh, Voter ID Act. And again, as counsel, we had, we introduced, when we were still in the minority, uh, I was counsel to the committee, we introduced a version of voter ID where you had to show an ID, but if you didn't have an ID, you could sign, 
whoops, you could sign an affidavit and you would be allowed to vote. And my question is, would you support that kind of legislation if it were an initiative in uh, California or in Colorado? Yeah. Well, let me start. So on um, Dornan Sanchez, um, let me first, you know, I, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time talking about something that had happened 15 years ago, but um, if you're interested in the full story, I highly recommend this book to you, The Myth of Voter Fraud by Professor Lori Minaiti. She goes into it in great detail, but as you know, there was a vigorous dispute on the task force with the two Republicans concluding that there had been 624 votes illegally cast, the Democrat on the task force disputing that conclusion. Um, I think it's fair to say that that would be a significant number, although surely not enough to have swung that election. But the, the point is this, was there in fact fraudulent voting? We know there were people who registered before they should have, right? They were sent this letter saying, congratulations, your application for citizenship had been approved. Uh, they were told erroneously that they could register. Some of them did. We don't know exactly how many of those voted. You're certainly right that there, there were a lot of problems with INS records, which make it very difficult to establish exactly how many people were and weren't citizens. But I, I would contest the claim that it was proven that 624 people illegally voted, in fact, um, as Professor Minaiti describes, the California Secretary of State in the end announced that those who were shown to have voted illegally wouldn't be prosecuted for voter fraud because they didn't intentionally vote illegally. And let's emphasize also, this is not something that is going to be addressed by a voter identification requirement. People who are documented immigrants, even if they're not citizens, may still have a driver's license, and it may be that those people have become citizens between the point at which they got their ID, even if it's stamped non-citizen, and the point at which they vote. Um, I want to start by saying I think a number of us have normative premises, premises and, and that they might be different, right? Dan mentioned that we all want everyone to vote. And, and I think certainly my take is I believe in government of, by, and for the people. I think it's good to kind of have, have, have broad inclusion. I think there's some people who, who have very legitimate perspectives who might feel like we'd have better decision making if only maybe those people who really wanted to vote uh, would, would cast a ballot or uh, a subset of the population cast a ballot and that we'd have more informed decision making uh, and that's a different perspective. But based on this notion that we want everyone to cast a ballot, government of, by, and for the people, uh, I, I think I am more comfortable with an affidavit bypass with an ID requirement than I am with a strict ID requirement. That said, the Alvarez study basically shows that these different types of ID requirements, whether it's ID, ID with an affidavit, signature match, they all have different uh, impacts in terms of turnout. So for me, I'd really just need to see the data about fraud and access, impact on access, and that's what would guide me, the evidence, the data, and that, that's what I, I'd need to look at. Great, thank you. Next question. It, oh, I'm sorry, was it? It works, all right. Um, okay, I'm from Mississippi. The state just uh, enacted a voter ID law by initiative, uh, and I think I sense a disconnect um, between the audience and the panel, and I'm just feeling a little bit like Rodney Dangerfield and back to school. I'm wondering, how many of you on the panel have actually been a poll worker or a poll watcher in a hotly contested election? Because a lot of us out here have. Okay. 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 That was easy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, although, let me just Which say it? very quickly, I was in Washington in like 2002 or uh, right after the 2000 election, I came up to work at the Justice Department and I went to this meeting that had been called the National Academy of Sciences. Dan, I don't know if you were there. No. It was this meeting of, they'd been called to say, what should we do to fix our elections, to fix the problems? And it, the room was filled to capacity with academics, 
and advocates and all these people. And in fact, Pepper, I asked that exact same question because I kept hearing all this stuff that was completely impractical. And that question was asked of everybody in the room, and I think in the entire auditorium, there were actually three people in the room that had ever had anything to do with real, real elections. Okay. Yes, sir. It's not been mentioned today, but uh, I think it should be brought out for those few people who don't know it, <clears throat> that there are some leaders in one of the political parties in Washington who want the illegal aliens to vote. Uh, my question is for Professor Overton. I think you said that um, three or five percent of the students at a certain university in Wisconsin or Minnesota, some place like that, only three percent of them had uh, proper identification to vote. Well, don't you see a danger there that these students uh, um, may want to vote at their university where they're living? and then also would like to cast the ballot uh, somewhere else in the state or in a different state where their real home is. So, there are a variety of studies that are out about residency requirements and students and the complexity of residency requirements. And uh, I would agree with you that double voting is something that should be uh, should not be tolerated and should be prosecuted, right? But I also think that we want students to vote. We want to encourage them to vote. We don't want to make it hard for them to vote. And if they consider their residence to be where they go to school, frankly, even if they're paying out-of-state tuition, which is the rule in many states, that the notion of residency for voting is different than residency for other purposes, I think we want them to cast a ballot. What I said was, only 3% at this Wisconsin State School had a photo ID with their dorm address, their current address on it. So in other words, if you had a photo ID requirement that required that you have your current address as opposed to a past address, those people wouldn't be able to cast a ballot. And that's, again, all these laws are different and it dep depends on kind of the severity of the law. Look, double voting is a problem. Um, the New York Daily News reported in 2004 that 46,000 people in New York City were registered to vote in both the city and Florida. That does not even count the rest of the state. They also found that between 600 and 1,000 of those people had double voted in the most recent election. Now, that may not sound like a lot of people, double voting, but I would remind you it was in Florida in 2000 where the margin of difference between George Bush and Al Gore was 537 votes. Double voting ha can have consequences, just like felon voting did in Minnesota, where we now have 144 convictions of people who knowingly and illegally voted in 2008 in that close Senate race decided by 312 votes. Small numbers can have profound consequences. John, John access to arms. Uh, can allow some people to go in and shoot up this room and, you know, de demolish this. So does that mean that we should just ban guns in the United States and have restrictive gun control because, you know, our liberties allow some people to engage in improper behavior? Now, let's see. 46,000 people registered to vote in both New York City and Florida. And we're not even counting all of the other retirement uh, places that people uh, may have double voting. I think that's a fairly high chance, more far more so than perhaps somebody getting a hold of a bazooka or a submachine gun walking into this room. I think when you have 46,000 double voters, but and the you, New York they, Daily but News finds- But they're not 46,000, you just said no, no, they no, were don't. 46, Wait, they, you said that they were registered they, multiple places. And, 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 and I have, said, now, if you let we, me finish, I said between 600 and We do not have 46,000 uh, no, double uh, voters. No, no, no. That, is no. untrue. I said that. How many six, of I us? I said between six. Hold on, hold on. Order, 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 order. Let me order. say that it, there are a number Dan, of people Dan, in this it? room Double who have registrants. moved from one state to another at one time in your lives and have probably appeared on more than one registration list unless you ha you thought of calling back to your own state and canceling your registration. What are the facts as far as double voting, proven double voting? Well, while Hans was in the, the um, 
I don't know if he was in there at the time, but during the Bush administration between 2002 and 2005, there was an aggressive effort to prosecute voter fraud cases. They came up with 26 convictions, five of which were for double voting. I don't say it never happens, but it is extremely rare. What I said was between 600 and 1,000 people, according to the New York Daily News investigation, had actually voted in both New York City and in Florida. A total of 46,000 are registered in both places. I gave you two sets of numbers. But if you look at the, if you look at the research on Dr. of Dr. Michael McDonald and Justin Levitt on this subject, you'll find that there are a lot of matching errors which result in double vote, voting being reported when in fact it is by people who may share the same name but are in fact different people. Okay. Can, can I, can I Hans. Let, let me respond to something because Dan, Dan keeps bringing this up. He keeps bringing up the fact that there was this concerted effort for three years in the Bush administration to try to do voter fraud cases. I always have to laugh when I hear that uh, for, because for those of you who don't know, um, the criminal division of the Department of Justice, in fact the public integrity section, is responsible for criminally prosecuting election crimes. Now, how many lawyers do you all think they have full-time prosecuting election crimes across the United States? Anybody care to guess? I'll tell you, uh, when I was there, they had one lawyer. Now, now, hold now on. she had help from another, uh, he had help from another lawyer. How many lawyers do you think they have in the Civil Rights Division, which is responsible for uh, prosecuting uh, violations of federal voting rights laws on a civil basis like the Voting Rights Act. Well, when I was there, they had about 42 lawyers. So the emphasis between the two was greatly different. Now, it is true that U.S. attorneys around the country can also prosecute voter fraud cases, but I can tell you they just weren't much interested in it uh, because when you're prosecuting, and this is the whole problem with prosecution of voter fraud, you know, when you're facing murder cases and drug smuggling and you're um, l allowing guns to rock across the border, you're just not very interested <laughs> in prosecuting run-of-the-mill uh, voter, voter fraud cases. And so there's never been this huge, there's never been the resources and time applied to this on the federal level uh, that we have in other aspects of the voting uh, area. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, my name's Tony Barta. I'm from Wisconsin, and my state has been mentioned several times here. So I have a question, but I first want to correct a couple of things. First of all, we've had same-day registration forever, and we're not happy with it. We just, we just passed a voter ID law because of it. And those students who couldn't get the IDs, that's all straightened out in the legislation. Not a problem. It was corrected in legislation. They're getting those IDs had their officers go out and investigate these voting discrepancies. Up to six months ago, that report was still online, and I would encourage anybody here who's really interested in what it really said to go read it. Because, sir, as you might recall, there was a lot more than just seven felons that voted. There was a student dorm that had more people registered there than were in the dormitory. We had uh, the, the workers that had been brought in in the presidential campaign registered in Wisconsin, voted, and left town the next day. We had lots of, lots of things like that going on, and that's, in our state, what powered this whole thing. But I agree with you, the real problem is probably absentee ballots. Does anybody really have a constructive solution to making absentee ballots more foolproof? beyond getting it notarized and all the rest of it. You'd, I think that was think directed to everyone on the panel, so. Uh, I, I think I we've have, already discussed that. I mean, we've already discussed it. I, I think what Kansas did is good. Another thing that, that should be done, and unfortunately some states haven't, is um, states should not have allow, uh, laws that allow anybody other than immediate family to request an absentee ballot. In states where campaigns can do it, that's where you have problems, because campaign workers, they will go out, especially in poor neighborhoods, convince uh, voters to uh, request absentee ballots, and then they literally, and I saw this in a case, they will follow the U.S. postal truck from uh, mailbox to mailbox, 
and basically fraudulently vote, vote the ballots by telling the person how to vote or just getting them to sign it and filling it in. And there's been lots of cases like that. And there are laws you can, you can use to restrict that kind of thing. You know, I, I, I understand the Wisconsin police report has often been discredited, but the facts in it have not been. Um, the report concluded there was an illegal organized attempt to influence the outcome of an election in the state of Wisconsin. It identified two 527 groups that placed thousands of staffers and volunteers, and those involved in illegal voting represented multiple levels of both organizations from upper management to the street level canvassers. Quote, there is a strong possibility the discovery of these random staffers voting illegally is the proverbial tip of the iceberg as it relates to an illegal organized attempt to influence the outcome of the election. Now, the Wisconsin Police Department is not much interested in promoting this uh, because I think they've fallen down on the job of combating voter fraud, but the facts in the report have never been challenged and not been effectively disputed. Uh, with all we due had, respect, that, had, is, that is not true. Uh, there are a lot of allegations that were made in the Wisconsin Police Department report. My colleagues and I at the Moritz College of Law wrote a report in um, 2007, which we followed up earlier this year with a follow-up report which discusses this in some detail. This is a great example of why police departments should not be making election policy. And if you look at the research that Professor Manaiti has done comparing voter fraud in EDR states, election day registration states, to allegations of voter fraud in non-EDR states, finds that there is not more voter fraud and certainly not more voter impersonation fraud in EDR states than in non-EDR states. Okay, thank you. Next, thank you. Next question, please. Yes, this, uh, the ID for voting issue tends to be phrased, including by this panel, in terms of, on the one hand, voter fraud, on the other hand, legitimate voter suppression. It seems to me there's another and much bigger issue, maybe the broader picture, which is that ID one by one, and almost all of this since 2000, has been proposed as the solution, very imperfect solution, to one problem after another, from terrorists on airplanes, voter fraud, money laundering. People here have mentioned that you need ID now to open a bank account. That wasn't true before 2000. Um, how about illegal aliens working? Well, make you show a voter ID to your employer, et cetera, et cetera. And little by little, voter, uh, ID doesn't work really for any of these things very well, but little by little, we have an internal passport that you need to do anything. What could go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, have, I testified before the commission that Professor Overden was a member of that I opposed <laughs> a national photo ID law that I believe this should be left to the states. Look, former Congressman Davis, uh, whom I interviewed recently, um, this is what he said. Voting the names of the dead and the non-existent cancels out the votes of citizens who are exercising their rights. I believe photo ID is a insufficient but necessary step to preventing this kind of fraud. If people doubt that this kind of voter fraud, both absentee and at the polls, exists, I don't. I've heard the peddlers of these ballots brag about it. I've been asked to provide the funds for it. I've sat in meeting rooms where such schemes were discussed, and I'm confident it has changed at least a few close local election results. I believe that it is very difficult to catch people committing voter fraud, but it is easy to establish a low-level deterrent such as simply asking people to prove who they say they are, that can, just by asking it, deter some people from indiscriminate fraud, either at the polls or absentee. I'll give you a quick example of what John just said, that it could change a close election. Uh, I have an article here from Carolina Journal. You all can look it up. North Carolina, you all may re know, the legislature there passed a photo ID law. It was vetoed by a Democratic governor, Governor Perdue, who, who, by the way, a couple of weeks later said that we ought to suspend congressional elections for a couple of years. Um, they have a great article about a, a guy who was running for sheriff in Washington County, North Carolina in 2010. He lost the race by four votes. So he got a hold of the voter registration list and started checking it after the race, and he found seven people uh, voted who shouldn't have. Why? Because they were dead. And uh, 
he says he felt certain that if they'd had photo ID at the polls, he'd be the sheriff in that county today. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I just, uh, I think this is an argument you haven't touched on yet. It's by Senator Metz, who I know was mentioned earlier. I looked it up on the internet real quick, who was the sponsor of the Rhode Island bill. He's an African American senior citizen Democrat. He said, and I'd like Professor Takai to respond to this, I cannot accept the logic of those who dismiss this by saying that there have been no formal complaints filed. The old system was not set up to readily weed out fraud, and it would be very hard to pr prove. Moreover, winners on election night would soon forget about any fraud, while the losers' concerns would be dismissed as sour grapes. How would you respond to that, Professor Takai? I mean, I would respond that we need to base our arguments on evidence of proven fraud rather than speculation about what might be going on. And in fact, you know, the Justice Department was very aggressively looking at these cases and putting pressure on U.S. attorneys to do so during the Bush administration. They won. They actually brought a lot more cases than they won because they weren't able to prove a lot of the allegations they were making. And uh, when you actually look hard at the evidence, look, you can't just say there's a lot of voter impersonation fraud out there. You've got to be able to prove it. And again, let me acknowledge the point that there are occasionally instances of insider fraud as well as schemes almost always perpetrated through absentee ballots. And, and I think these are things that we have to deal with. I'm very skeptical about whether voter ID is going to be a solution to any of these problems. Look, all I will tell you is <clears throat> Senator Metz told me and he's told others and wrote in the Woonsocket paper, my own state representative and his daughter had people vote in their name. I mean, this happens. That's not speculation. He witnessed it. He, 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 there are real people out there who this has affected. And look, I want people to be able to vote, but the way to both make it easy to vote and hard to cheat is not to argue about the number of voter fraud convictions or how much prosecutors are going to pursue these low-level cases. And prosecutors hate these cases because they're going to make half the political establishment that they depend upon for future advancement mad at them, whichever party it is. The way to do that is to deter people from, vo from vote, vote fraud, not to chase it after the fact, because in most cases we toss all the ballots into one pool and we can never segregate them out. It's very difficult to prove voter fraud after it happens. It is relatively easy and relatively cost-free to deter people from committing voter fraud. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Spencer. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I wasn't thanking you for that applause. Because I, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> um, so I'd just say uh, Rhode Island, again, you know, has an affidavit bypass procedure here, so I think it is a little bit different. Uh, number two, I, I would say that justice fraud can change a close election. Uh, excluding legitimate voters from casting a ballot can as well. And the question is, we need to look at the data to determine which is more likely to do so. Um, my, my third point is that, you know, actually fraud studies can be done, so it's not just prosecutions uh, that can occur, but, you know, you can actually go and say, you know, hey, I see that you voted. Did you actually vote? Was that you that was at the poll? So you can do academic studies uh, on fraud, and we don't have uh, significant and, and, and good studies in terms of fraud. And then the final point I would make, uh, we haven't talked much about, is um, this is the people kill people, guns don't kill people argument, right? Which is that if someone really wants to commit fraud with technology today, it is not all that easy to get a fake ID. USA Today, for example, basically reports that using the internet, anyone willing to break a few laws can be a mass producer of fake IDs. Uh, a few years ago, the Birmingham Post ran a headline that stated, Bush daughter used fake ID to buy alcohol here. So I don't, I don't know that this is the, the answer uh, to the, the fraud problem, but again, uh, a number of legitimate people and legitimate voters could be, could be turned away. Thank you, next question. Thank you, I'm uh, Daryl Wald from California. 
It strikes me that we're, we've been focusing very, uh, almost exclusively on only one side of the, or one aspect of the considerations here, and that is on whether there actually has been voter fraud. But I think we could draw a useful analogy from the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in the campaign finance area, where the court has repeatedly said that a justification for the, for the infringement of campaign finance regulations on, on protected First Amendment rights is not only to deter the actuality of corruption, mm -hmm. but the appearance of the possibility of corruption. And some of the examples that have been given here of the results of voters voting on uh, more stringent or voter ID requirements or more stringent uh, voter qualification requirements indicates, I think, very strongly that voters are concerned about the appearance of the, or the possibility of fraud and not persuaded just that there has been fraud, but they want to know something about the integrity of their system. Yeah. The Supreme Court has said the integrity of the system is important in campaign finance, and it strikes me it's equally important, uh, the integrity of the voting system is e equally important to the confidence of government of the voters. Uh, any comments on that as a justification for a more stringent uh, voter requirements? Sure. I, I, I um, d disagree with you. Um, I think we should be basing our analysis on whether this law, in fact, will prevent fraud rather than on some sense of appearance or voter confidence. But even if we accept your argument, Right. There's actually been some empirical research on this. Professors and Sola Bahir of Harvard and Persley of Columbia did study on exactly this question and, and among other things found that voters who live in states with restrictive ID laws have no greater confidence in the integrity of their election system than those who do not. So even if you believe in the appearance idea, the evidence does not support the conclusion that having a voter ID law increases voter confidence in election integrity. Um, uh, I, I would say, and just very honestly, you know, I've been like a campaign reformer in the past. I'm just, you know, a, a great target for, for federalists here. Uh, but, um, you know, really in the last five years, this argument, this argument about the appearance of fraud and we need this ID, has caused me to change my thinking about at least the appearance of corruption justification in terms of the campaign finance context. I mean, I continue to be concerned about corruption and preventing corruption, but this notion that we want to restrain liberties because of appearances, that's a concern that, the, you know, hey, should we prohibit interracial marriage or something because we're concerned about this is, you know, the appearance of, uh, uh, you know, society and morals going down. I think that that's a real concern and problem in terms of restraining individual liberties because of appearances as opposed to uh, evidence. And so I, I'm a little more skeptical of campaign finance laws as just very, very honestly as a, uh, as a result of my experience in this area, or at least that justification. Uh, Hans. Well, let me, let me say first, by the way, that, that the uh, questioner, Daryl Walsh, knows a bit about campaign finance. He's a former chairman of the uh, Federal Election Commission and served before me there. Um, in fact, John Lott did a great uh, survey on this in which he found that uh, voter ID laws actually do increase confidence of voters in the election process. And I can tell you, I did a case study, not on vote, voter ID laws, but on the fact that serious attention by the government to voter fraud will increase the confidence of people in election. There's a great case rising out of Greene County, Alabama, in the Black Belt that Arthur Davis was talking about. Uh, a voter fraud prosecution there in the 1990s. Uh, local incumbent black Democratic officials had been stealing uh, ballots for years. They were, it was an all Democratic county, 80% black county. They were challenged by black Democratic reformers who won the election but had their ballots stolen. Uh, they were prosecuted by the Justice Department. The Justice Department eventually got 11 prosecutions. And throughout the entire process, the NAACP and the SCLC, instead of going in and trying to help the reformers, went in and protected the incumbents who had stolen the election to the point where the NAACP 
basically compared the Justice Department to Nazis for doing this, saying they were trying to suppress the black vote. And actually, the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP actually defended one the, of the indiv individuals, right, who, who eventually were convicted. One of them, a local city councilor, was the treasurer of the SCLC. And even after he pled guilty to voter fraud, uh, continued to be uh, on their board. The point of this is that if you look at turnout in that county after the successful prosecutions, the turnout of the African American voters there went up. And that was made clear to me why when one of the FBI agents I interviewed for this told me that one of the elderly African American uh, women that he had interviewed as a witness called him up after these successful prosecutions and said, thank you so much for doing this. I finally feel like my vote counts. You know, one of the saddest things I've found in researching my book is there are cities and places in this country that are terribly misgoverned, where people do not have basic public services delivered efficiently. And as Hans mentioned, whether it's Laredo, Texas, where Democratic Congressman Sura Rodriguez felt that he lost an election due to voter fraud, whether it's Detroit, where the challenger to Kwame Kilpatrick, the uh, corrupt mayor of Detroit who later served some time in federal public housing, uh, <laughs> saw, saw thousands of votes stolen from him when he challenged the Kilpatrick machine, whether it's St. Louis, where reformed minority Democrats have lost to the machine over and over again. It's often minority voters who are the biggest victims of this kind of fraud, as Artur Davis indicates happened in the Black Belt of Alabama. And it can change. Detroit now has an African-American former professor of mathematics as its clerk, and she has cleaned up the voter rolls. And it has a better mayor, Mayor Bing, who is trying to improve the city through economic development and charter schools. This is part of a reform movement because we have cities that are ungovernable in which people are leading desperate lives. Cleaning up voter fraud in places, and don't tell me there isn't voter fraud in Detroit and St. Louis and Laredo, Texas, I've seen it. Cleaning that up is part of restoring our civic health. Dan. Well, I find myself on a rare point of agreement with John, because I, I do think that... We'll have to mark, mark this somewhere yeah, in, the, right. in a book. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot of local government entities that are poorly run, and there certainly have been lots of instances in that in election administration. Milwaukee, which we talked about earlier, was an example both of a poorly run local election system and of fixing it. They've got um, folks in there right now who are doing a much better job of running that election system. And, and if you look back though, at, if you look back at, at the instances where there's actually been cheating shown, right? You know, we do have plenty of examples, not so much recently, but occasionally recently, and certainly in the past, of insider fraud, right? Ballot stuffing, the LBJ stuff that John talks about in his book. I mean, this has happened. The only thing I want to emphasize here is that, you know, if you've got a, that badly run an election system, and certainly if you've got people on the inside that are cheating, a voter ID law is not going to help you. That, that is untrue. And I'll give you a quick example of this. And one of the reasons Mississippi probably approved their voter ID laws, there's a great case Court decision won by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2007 is called U.S. v. Brown. Ike Brown was a local uh, head of the Democratic Party, had no official position, but he basically had this machine there that allowed him to get elected whoever he wanted. I mean, uh, people in New York and Chicago would be jealous. Um, there's a great footnote in the court decision. He was found guilty of violating the Voting Rights Act. He was engaging in vote suppression. He was discriminating engaging in uh, all kinds of absentee ballot fraud. Footnote 73, former deputy sheriff testified that, quote, he saw Ike Brown outside the door of the precinct talking to a young lady, young black lady named Bridget Brown, had heard him tell her to go in there and vote, to use any name, and that no one was going to say anything. Now, it's true that the election officials in there probably would have cooperated because they'd all been picked by Ike Brown, but you see, the whole reason that case came to the attention of the Justice Department is because there were poll watchers in that precinct. But, but, but the, and the poll watchers reported on what was going on. And if that woman had gone in to that polling place and had tried to vote in a name that was not her name, 
and she had not pulled out a voter ID card, a photo ID card, if they'd had a requirement for that. The poll watchers wouldn't have been able to see what was happening, and they could have reported it. And so even when you have insider fraud, a photo ID law can do something, and that is it can give poll watchers, and it's good we have that kind of transparency. We have people from both parties there to observe what's happening, because it was the poll watchers that told us at the Justice Department uh, what was going on. And I should mention, by the way, that we got into huge trouble and were criticized by the NAACP, including me, for pursuing that case because the defendant was African American and we were using the Voting Rights Act to go after him, uh, even though a court eventually found he'd engaged in blatant discrimination and the case was upheld uh, by the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals uh, and they found that he had engaged in all kind of wrongdoing. Quickly, by way of response, was there a photo ID requirement in the state at the time? Uh, there was not, but my point okay. is that you're saying that even if you have a photo ID requirement, if you have insiders engaged in fraud, photo ID isn't going to do any good. And I'm telling you that if there are poll watchers there who can report on what's going on and can say the election officials are not complying with the photo ID requirement or they're allowing people to vote who's photo ID does not match the registered but, but, name, but, then it is going to do good. That if you've got right? insiders, you think they're going to apply any ID law you have, whether it's the HAVA ID requirement, which is already in place, or a stricter photo ID requirement, you think they're going to apply that requirement in an even-handed way. The solution to this kind of problem, and I do acknowledge there are pockets of the country occasionally where these sorts of things do go on, this, the, 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 the solution to that problem is for prosecutors, whether from the Department of Justice or from the state, to go in there and get those people out or at least get them to stop doing what they've been doing. Okay. Yes, sir. Question. Yes. Uh, actually, the conversation kind of steered towards my question, but I'll present it anyhow. I'm from Albany, New York, home of a <clears throat> notorious political machine. And here's uh, in New York, uh, we sign, countersign, but the signature is there, so it's not really a trick to match the signature. But part of the intent of the law, we have very small election districts. No more than 300 people can reside in an election district under the theory that inspectors would know the people who come. Now, while that works in the great portion of Albany County and the great portion of the state, where it breaks down, I think, is in two ways, in two places. In jurisdictions like the city of Albany, which is dominated by one political party, and there's insufficient numbers of the opposition party, and oftentimes lack of interest in the opposition party, to monitor those elections, and even if they brought, on, on certain uh, elections, brought uh, party, mem party watchers in from the opposite political faith to watch, they aren't familiar with the people yeah. in that neighborhood. Yeah. So it seems to me, oh, and just one other aside, we've looked at Albany County and the city of Albany. Generally, the, the types of fraud we see, and, and my ancillary question would be if studies of this have been done, is generally the, the voting fraud we've seen or can prove is voting for the dead. People usually have died within the last 60 days. So my question is, have there been studies that focus on where there's political dominance in a jurisdiction, because that would seem where it'd be the greatest amount of fraud, and whether ID prevents that when you have outside people come in? And two, is there any particular studies done with respect to whether ID stops, uh, uh, if there's been a delta after ID's law passed and, and dead people voting? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think there's been any study either way on that specific point, but let me agree with what I take to be a big part of the premise of your question, which is that we've got a real problem um, at the state level and especially at the local level, at least in some places, with partisan control of the machinery of elections. And I think that is a real problem, and the best solution to that is to either have, you know, I, I think bipartisan boards or genuinely nonpartisan officials. You know, there are some places, there are a lot of places in this country where we have pretty good models of local election administration. I actually think despite all the problems that my state has had in the past, one of the things we're pretty good on is we have Democrats and Republicans in each of our counties keeping an eye on each other, and I think that system works fairly well. 
I think we can have a note of agreement here. Okay. Uh, one uh, of the 87 recommendations that the commission that uh, Professor Overton served on, some of those do lead to the departisanization of the election process, and I'm in favor of many of them. Uh, Pennsylvania is a perfect example. A former congressman, Austin Murphy, pleaded guilty to ballot fraud uh, a few years ago. He was going into the homes of Alzheimer's patients uh, in nursing homes and helping them, assisting them, shall we say, with their vote, uh, including filling out the form for them. Uh, he was convicted. Now, if a former congressman is willing to do that, just imagine what some ordinary blokes might want to do. Pennsylvania's solution to that was, if you're in an assisted living facility or nursing home where there might be some mental impairment, voting is on one day, a bipartisan team, one Democrat and one Republican, go into the, into the nursing home at the same time and they check and watch each other. Because fraud can come from any party. And in this case, it has dramatically reduced the incidence of voter fraud in Alzheimer's patients and in nursing homes. Spencer. I was just going to say, we talked about studies of fraud and, you know, this notion of comparing uh, death rolls with voting rolls, not just who's registered, because somebody can be on both, but who actually voted, you know, is possibly one way to ascertain the volume of fraud that exists. So again, there are some ways to uh, determine uh, uh, levels of fraud. Not perfect, you know, uh, the poll worker can make a mistake in terms of checking off one person rather than the other, but uh, certainly uh, that's, that's one possible tool. We're in the penalty period, but we have one gentleman who's been standing patiently. We're gonna let you get your question in. Thank you, I'll try to make this quickly. Uh, since there has been a, a few propositions of horse trading and a couple of you seem to be uh, <laughs> entirely opposed to voter ID, but you don't seem to have problems with uh, trying to clean up effectively the voting system, I would suggest that when Democrat uh, Secretary of State of Alabama, Glenn Browder, found that 117% uh, of DeKalb County was registered to vote, and 121% of Jackson County, Alabama, was registered to vote, uh, generally regarded as two redneck areas of the state. Wouldn't you agree, Hans? Uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, not a traditional <laughs> minority area where you might be suspecting fraud in Alabama, but it was just the good old boys were cheating. Uh, would you be opposed to a complete re-registration as Secretary of State Glenn Browder did at that time so that you could clean up the rolls, you could have people uh, prove up their ID at the time, uh, so that uh, as opposed to us having the general population vote, that we would have elections by the eligible citizens for the eligible citizens right. okay. now, now, of this country. Right. So, well, I, so what, what I, my response to that would be that I don't believe that most of those people are registered in voting. I think that a lot of people move from place to place and because you're required to re-register, there are people who re-registered but they remain, the, they weren't taken off of the list. So I don't look at this as, boy, you know, 90% of those people are bad actors, they're uh, committing fraud. I would say that, and this is maybe next year's uh, panel, uh, that if we had something like uh, voter registration modernization or something else that actually took people off of the rolls when they moved and allowed them to automatically be on the rolls in their new place of residence, that that would deal with that problem. Uh, you know, there'd be some administrative efficiency, we'd save some money, but then also it would uh, ensure that, that uh, we, we don't have the, the problems that, that you mentioned. Well, and new technology well, may be our friend in that. Right. Well, and, let me, and so, let me, and so let me long add. as the technology uh, took into account the, the new death records and those people who were taking up government paid vacations with three hots and a cot, yeah. it might actually work. Great, thank you. I think Hans is All gonna right. have the last I'm gonna word have the, here. I'm gonna have the final word on this. Um, since I have a room full of lawyers, I'll tell you a great way you can make some money, okay? The National Voter Registration Act has a provision in it that requires states to clean up their voter rolls on a regular basis. And there are many states that aren't doing it. 
And in fact, for the first 10 years the law was in play, certainly during the Clinton administration, they never filed a single lawsuit against any state to enforce that provision because they didn't want to enforce it. Uh, we got into huge problems during the Bush administration when I was there because we actually filed the first lawsuits to enforce that provision and we were accused of trying to suppress the vote because we were trying to get states like Indiana, who 40% of their reg statewide reg registration role was bad because we tried to get them to do that. Uh, we filed a lawsuit against Missouri, had the same problem. They had one county with 140 uh, percent registered voters in comparison to what the census said they had population. Funny thing, that lawsuit was almost immediately dismissed two months after the Obama administration came in. And you know there's been sworn testimony saying they have no intention of uh, enforcing that provision. So what I say to you is check your state if you find that local counties, the state, they aren't cleaning up their voter registration rolls, you can file a lawsuit under the National Voter Registration Act, and guess what? You can get attorney's fees when you win. Okay. I actually misspoke. Hans doesn't have the last word, but Dan really does. This really is the last word. Okay, I'll be very quick. Uh, let me suggest another way of making money on attorney's fees, which I suspect is much less likely to be taken up by the audience uh, here. Maybe next time I'm speaking at the ACS convention, I'll suggest this one. But um, uh, NVRA also requires motor vehicle agencies and public assistance offices to offer registration to eligible voters. There's evidence that that is not being fully complied with in many states. I think we can all agree that the government should be complying with its obligations to make sure that all eligible citizens are registered to vote. We are clearly a long way from that in this country, and this is something we need to work on. Great. But let me remind you that uh, John Fund will be signing copies of his book out in the hallway immediately after the break. Will you join me in thanking our panelists for this excellent discussion? <laughs>